from the beginning, man has possessed the attributes of the animal. Speed, power, dynamic movement, the instinct to exploit the weakness of his prey. And from his human inventiveness came weapons that could puncture and slash his enemy's flesh. In his struggle to survive, he developed tactics to heighten his advantage. Gradually, man created a knife culture, which has changed very little as it has cut its way through time. fluid in movement, still slashing and stabbing its enemies, the knife culture is still alive and deadly. What's happening, man? Now that's it. You got the money, man? Let me see the shit, man. The shit's there, man. Where's the money? Five minutes. Five minutes, baby. No, oh, man, no money, no shit. Ah, oh, man, five minutes. Oh, fuck you, man. <laughs> <laughs> While the knife culture continues to hone its skills, some officers still commit one tactical error after another by failing to assess the real dangers, by using ineffective and dangerous deployment, and by underestimating the degree of threat. 708 dispatch. Go ahead, 708. I need an ambulance and a backup. Yet 80% of you have removed edged weapons from suspects that could have been used against you. Make that 1017. 10-4-7-8. 30% of you have already been threatened with edged weapons. And if an assault is attempted against you, there's a one in three chance that you will be wounded. Sergeant, take his gun belt off. Okay, I got it. I got the pretty. Everything's going to be all right. You need to put an acoustic in your hand. I need a blood pressure. All right? We'll breathe in here, buddy. We'll breathe in shell. We've got a policy on the floor. Around 30 and regular. In the last 10 years, injuries to officers from edged weapons have increased 92%. We've got wet bristles on the left side. Many officers dismiss the edged weapon as a mere relic from man's primitive roots. 
But this relic still has the intent and means to destroy the enemy. And today, in the eyes of the knife culture, the enemy can be you. Our goal is to help you avoid becoming an edged weapon statistic by teaching you how to make a proper threat assessment, how to select the proper force option for dealing with knives, and how to react with control. All words, eyes, no pulse. The first step is to become aware that edged weapon attacks often occur in unlikely situations, often when you're distracted or not expecting them at all. Police department. Thorny? Jim Thorny? Thorny, I got a warrant for you. I know you're in there. Come on to the door. The use of the unexpected is a favorite tactic of edged weapon offenders. I told you three times to stop by on the customers. This time you're going to jail. Why don't you leave me alone, man? Why don't you back off? No, this time you're going to jail. You're too close. Some survivors have found this out the hard way. The basic perception if you get into a knife attack is there's going to be one single thrust. You're going to cleanly and effectively block it, and that's going to be the end of it. You're going to apply a little bit of your academy taught self-defense. You're going to bend that knife out of his hand and arrest the bad guy, and that's the end. It doesn't work that way, sports fans. Things go from bad to horrible real quick. Right away, you're in deep shit. You're in bad shape. You're in a bad place. Faster than you ever perceive it happening to you. When I first saw the knife, it surprised the hell out of me, to be honest with you. Uh, for one thing, it wasn't your normal three-inch buck knife that usually most of your street people carry or whatever. Uh, uh, it was subsequently learned that he was a butcher at a local slaughterhouse. And uh, this is an implement he used to slaughter uh, beef with. It was about an eight inch bony fillet knife. And it, it was bright out. It was 6.30 in the morning and during the summer. And you know, there's just something that kind of uh, spooky about looking at an eight inch knife with the sun gleaming off of it. In this case, at first, I never saw the knife. Uh, I backed up and when the suspect came out, he lunged at me. I saw something and I didn't know what it was in his right hand. And I was about five feet away from him. Uh, and the next thing, we were on the ground. I was, I was back down, he was on top of me. Uh, I felt a couple of blows to my stomach area, mid-stomach area, and then from then, we just, you know, we kind of locked. And uh, it was then trying to take him into custody. And the whole time this was going on, he, uh, kept stating that he was going to kill me. And I was, uh, I was unable to take him into custody. I only managed to get one handcuff on him. Uh, I said a little prayer in my mind uh, and started calling for another officer. Uh, when I went to the bottom of the stairs after entering the house, where I had noted that the door had been broken open, I approached the stairs and hollered up, uh, up the stairs and the two offenders came around the stairs and down the stairs towards me. That was the only way for them to get out of the house past me. I produced my 45 semi-automatic pistol and told them to put their hands up in the air and the one closest to me reached up and grabbed the barrel of my gun. Uh, as he did that, I pulled him towards me, grabbed him by the throat, but he had a free hand. In that free hand, he had a knife, a knife that I never noticed as he was coming down the stairs. And uh, I never noticed it in spite of the fact that I was looking consciously for a weapon in the hands of uh, both of the two offenders as they came down the stairs. Uh, probably my own fault. I never saw the knife. I just couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. It happened so fast that this subject was supposed to be dead. And now, a second later, I find out not only is he alive, but he's trying to kill me. 
And when he flashed that knife in front of my face, it was instantaneous fear. It was terror. It was terrifying. And then when he cut my wrist, uh, I really didn't feel that much pain in the wrist, but it was a sh just a shock to look down and see, and it looked like your hand was just hanging there. Just before the emotionally disturbed uh, female stabbed my partner to death, uh, he didn't have a chance to go for his gun. It happened uh, too quick. Uh, we were unprepared. You show me a cop that doesn't take a knife seriously. And I'll show you a cop that's never been cut. Getting cut happens in one of two ways. One is a stabbing motion, usually meant to kill, which causes the weapon to puncture tissue, producing internal bleeding and destruction not visible from the outside. Death can result with a penetration of less than one inch in some locations. Since a relatively small amount of skin is damaged typically, Blood showing from a wound may be slight because of the pressure exerted on the wound by surrounding tissue. Movement during the attack may make the wound larger and more serious before the blade is pulled out. The other way you get cut is a slashing motion, usually meant to disable you. The attacker can direct the blade to achieve deep cuts. Some edged weapons are even capable of amputating an arm. Slashes can also cause long cuts. The extensive severing of arteries and veins may release a lot of blood. Knife attacks are seldom static. They are usually dynamic with multiple redirected strikes, inflicting multiple stabs and slashes, and sometimes unanticipated reactions. And they were female college students, you know, late teenagers, and I didn't feel particularly threatened by them. Now, I'm not sure whether it was a male or female or who it was or where it was that the knife came from, but we've always suspected it was probably one of those girls in the, the front ranks that did it. And I think that what, what made me drop my guard was the fact that, that I had the, you know, the combatant, I had the belligerent guy, and I had him handcuffed, and I had him under control. He wasn't going anywhere. And I was so concerned with dealing with him, I wasn't thinking of these uh, teenage kids as much of a threat. I talked to my partner after situation. Uh, he told me that he in fact thought that the suspect was going to punch him, that he was watching the suspect's eyes and didn't uh, relate or didn't move to the fact that he was going behind his back. He thought he was going to get punched and was bracing himself for the punch. Uh, to react to that and didn't realize the fact that he was stabbed. I really have uh, no awareness over the years of any thought that I may have given to what it might feel like to be stabbed. But as the, uh, the primary offender and I wrestled, uh, he with uh, a hold of the barrel of my 45 pistol um, and me with a handful of his throat with my left hand, of course, his right hand was free, and I remember that it was over my shoulder. He was right in here on top of me, and it was over my left shoulder. And I remember a burning sensation in my back, but I wasn't aware that he had stabbed me until we wrestled around and wound up on the floor with him under me and me on top of him. And I began to notice that everything was turning red under me. I was bleeding quite badly from uh, the two puncture wounds in my back. And he, he was the one that had the blood all over him. And for just a moment, I thought it was him that was hurt, not me. The place that she kept me was on the left forearm. And I, I saw the knife as it was cutting my skin. And I saw the blood as the blood was coming out. And then the sight of the blood and the pain, it was very painful, made me, my heart just stopped. I, 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 had, I had no feelings as far as, as um, you know, no emotion, but my, my thoughts were, you know, I, I was thinking, get away, you know, this hurts, this is very painful, but I couldn't, it was like, like somebody was on top of me or something was stopping me, I couldn't move. But yet I could still see her, she cut the forearm and then, then proceeded, the knife went then into the bicep and cut very deeply into my bicep. I could, I could see it gashing open, I could see the meat, I could see the muscle of my bicep and the blood, there was a lot of blood 
and the only thing I could think of was, you know, get away. And she swung again, and this time getting the right forearm, much, much larger cut than the first time on the other forearm. And then I saw the knife go into the right bicep, and, and this was even deeper cut than the other side also. And I, I, could, I, could see the, I could see the tendon in my arm. In a split second, he just reached down and produced a 13 and a half inch butcher knife and just flashed it right across my face. He slashed my left wrist. At that point, it was horrifying. Uh, I saw it look like my hand was just hanging there. And it was, it was just terror. I was scared to death. And the one thing I wanted to do was I wanted to get away from him. I wanted to put some distance between us. So when I turned around to try to get out of that shed, he just literally exploded off of that garden tractor and he grabbed a hold of the back of my jacket. Well, when he grabbed a hold of the back of my jacket, he uh, continued to stab me as I was running, trying to get him off of my back. Uh, he stabbed me in my right shoulder, or he cut through the rotator cuff in my shoulder. He uh, then stabbed me in my left shoulder. Uh, he stabbed me right through the center of my back, which went all the way through my uniform and the body armor. Uh, I continued to run, just trying to get him off of my back. And then he stabbed me the last time in the left side of my chest, which that one collapsed my lung. That was devastating. That was just, it's hard to describe just how bad that hurt. Uh, he collapsed my lung. Uh, I couldn't breathe. I finally was able to get my gun out of my holster and just put it over my shoulder and fire. I knew that I just had to get him off of my back. I thought that that was the only way that I was going to survive this. Uh, I wasn't able to shoot him. I shot him in the side of the neck and the chest area. Uh, he fell off of my back. Uh, I staggered probably another 10 feet where I fell into the arms of my partner, face first into the ground, uh, where I went. I'm just lying there. The older brother took a utility knife, just a little one and a half inch long blade, out of his pocket and tried to slash my throat. He wanted to cut my throat. And I saw it coming out of the corner of my eye, not realizing it was a knife. I just saw a movement and blocked it, and it cut from my nose here all the way across under the nose and filleted my entire face open all the way down to my neck area here. Uh, it took about 80-some uh, about stitches to close the wound. I uh, almost died from loss of blood and had to go through a, six, a series of operations and microsurgery to get me back to normal. I spent two weeks on a life support system. But odd things. Um, it was it was cold, of course, being November. When he hit me, the, the pressure of the of the punch uh, and the shock of the punch, and also the traveling, the blade, the, the direction that it traveled, cut my uh, my nerve. So I didn't feel any pain. Didn't know I was cut. Unlike the Hollywood depiction of the single telegraphed strike, most edged weapon attacks against police are much less predictable and involve subjects whose behavior may not be so obvious. Your safest to treat any call as having some potential for an edged weapon attack. But realize that certain situations tend to carry great risk. For example, in making a traffic stop, a lack of caution in contacting the driver may bring you within range of common cutting weapons. Hi there. Say, do you have a driver's license? You just roll through that stop sign back there. And your partner may not even be in a position initially to help you or even see any threat. He's here somewhere. No problem. Something with your photo, name on it, that'll be fine. The deputy who stopped this truck didn't see a knife hidden in the crevice between the dashboard and the windshield. While the driver was standing outside, he reached in, grabbed the knife, let out a startling martial arts yell, and attacked. The deputy was stabbed nine times in the stomach, arm, shoulder, back, and ended up losing a kidney. On your vehicle stops, do you consider that a violator may have rigged up a scabbard in the armrest, allowing him to quickly arm himself? or that he may reach toward you with a driver's license that he's altered with a razor blade taped to the back. Even a common item, like an ice scraper, given the right offender and motivation, can suddenly become an edged weapon you may not be expecting. Keep them out. Nice and cool. 
Moving in for an arrest, you're necessarily oh. close. Be nice. Okay, come on, stand up, okay? Come on, stand up. Without good tactics, you make yourself vulnerable to an incredible array of edged weapons. Just a sampling of what's available is indicated by these knives recovered by courtroom officers. And these weapons taken from a search of students at a public school. Of course, you're aware of the ballet song or butterfly knife, whose folding handle aids in concealment. And you've probably seen a knife that looks like a ballpoint pen. But are you familiar with the Mexican sacatripe, used for gutting sheep and other warm-blooded animals? Or the butane lighter holder that conceals a push knife in back? Or the bracelet that pulls open into a knife? This commercially available rig gives an offender ready access to throwing darts hidden up his sleeve. This kind of money clip has more of a point to it than just holding cash. And a carrier like this, easily hidden under a shirt, can quickly arm a suspect with this wicked weapon. Tonto knives, among the deadliest fighting knives, have incredible penetration capability because of their special blade configuration. Plus, they can be used to crush a human skull. The ballistic knife can either be used for conventional slashes or stabs, or fired with deadly results by a powerful spring in the handle. There's also hidden danger in this lipstick tube, popular with prostitutes. Also sold on the open market is this key that opens into a knife, and this bear claw necklace. Adding to the threat are a host of improvised weapons, sunglasses that can be flicked to poke out your eyes, fish hooks hidden in earrings or stuck through pant legs to rip your fingers on a pat-down, boots with protruding spikes, a baseball cap with razor blades sewn to the back, which can be swung by the bill to cut your face. Even something like this mace, made by a teenager with lead and spikes in his workshop. Yet it's easy to forget the possibility of being confronted by one of these, isn't it? Have you ever turned your back on a suspect because you assumed he was unarmed? How many times have you allowed an unsecured arrestee to put his hands within easy reach of a pocket that might contain a weapon? Have you ever noticed how some officers drop their gaze and never tap into folded hands as a danger cue, or enter the inside position directly in front of an offender in the area he can control with his hands and arms? And how often have you seen or used the wall search which any suspect can defeat with practice. What's hard to imagine, unless you've already been a knife victim, is the speed with which attacks can occur. Switchblades and gravity blades can be drawn and used instantly. Folding blades, like buck knives, can be locked in place when drawn, even with one hand. Watch how fast someone who's really skilled can get into action with a knife. And concealment can be almost anywhere. Sometimes, poor tactics give an unarmed offender access to an officer's duty knife. Do your escort procedures make sure it stays secure? Okay, let's go to the car. Hey! Come on! One circumstance where you can anticipate edged weapons is the disturbance call. In fact, more officers are knife during disturbance calls than in all other situations combined. Police! Police department! Do you watch all the people who may be at the scene? Do you stay aware of everything around you that could be a weapon? Yesterday, 
Common household items can produce extreme damage. An attack with this grapefruit cutter would be like getting stabbed with two knives. And screwdrivers are the second most popular edged weapon used to commit civilian homicide. Take a guess at what common household item caused this fatal chest wound. This table fork. Officers who fall victim to edged weapons usually commit at least one critical error, like misreading what could be a weapon or misjudging the subject. Let's try it again this time. Why don't you leave the pens in the tray before you come through? Sure. Sometimes it's the unlikely individual who has the best chance of harming you. Tragically, it's been estimated that one out of every four edged weapon attacks could be prevented if updated intelligence information were known. Squad 21 to the dispatcher. Squad 21, go ahead. 10 7 with a violator, 41 southbound. It's a silver 78 Chevy two door, California plates, King. Ida, Lincoln, Mary, Edward. Uh, one white male occupant. Task Force Squad 21. In most situations, your threat assessment will have to begin by you identifying the suspect's potential for violence. Most civilians would never threaten you with an edged weapon. Even those who carry concealed knives generally do so to protect themselves against criminals. Squad 21. Squad 21, go ahead. Squad 21, be advised there's a possible local open warrant for DWI on that subject. The flight list to a Ron Thomas of Los Angeles. The warrant is on that subject. 10-4. But some will turn against you, if frightened or if provoked. Many civilians do live on the fringe of the knife culture. They're influenced by movies that glorify the blade. Heroes who build confidence in fighting back against the bad guy. Shut your engine off! What the fuck do you want? I want to see your driver's license. What for? Nice, I'm only a black from home. Why don't you let me go? Look, I just want to see your driver's license. Oh, Christ. I got it in here somewhere. It's in the car. I'll get it. Most people have drawn inner boundaries they don't want crossed. And sometimes, the blade is there to guard those boundaries. Here's my license. Why don't you come and get it? Adding to this country's heritage of edged weapons, as well as a growing knife culture in Canada, are new waves of immigrants from knife culture countries. In the Middle East, Mexico, South America, and Asia, it is not only common to carry edged weapons, it's common to use them. Besides violence launched at each other and civilian victims, there is the potential for these people to mistakenly associate you with police in their homeland. Often they're accustomed to police states where death squads and police torture are common. Also included in today's knife culture are emotionally disturbed persons, or EDPs. Included here are thousands of the homeless, an estimated one-third of whom are armed with edged weapons. Typically unskilled with weapons, but still dangerous, EDPs can quickly become the ultimate knife-wielding psycho. The edged weapon can hold a special power for them. It's part of their violent fantasies. EDPs are often portrayed by the media as poor, harmless, crazy people. Score 421. 421, go ahead. 421, meet security. Trouble with a patient identified as Ted Zimowitz, room 41. 
of the Mental Health Center, 9500 West Wisconsin. A coach with caution subject possibly armed with an edged weapon. 421 is 10 4. It's a hell of a way to start off a shift. But remember, EDPs have killed more officers with edged weapons than any other category of offender. To be especially feared are EDPs who do have edged weapon skills through military experience or learned while incarcerated. There are over 25,000 EDPs inside jails and prisons. And they're more dangerous when they're let out than before incarceration. Because of a paranoid fear of intrusion, your very presence may be experienced as an overwhelming threat. To him, the weapons he covets may be powerful crutches, and he knows you want to remove them to diminish him. Let me take this guy over here. Hey! Wyatt! Sir, I need you to come out of your cell. We have to move you down about two doors down. You need to come out now. Sir, can you hear me? You okay? Sir, we can do this either the easy way or the hard way. It's up to you. Whatever you want to do. Yeah. Sir, I want you to come out, and I want to see your hands now. Okay, man. Okay. Don't fuck with me. What you're looking at is something you've never seen before, but you've heard about. Inmates in a maximum security prison practicing their edged weapon skills. This is one training ground for the group that lives at the very heart of the knife culture and is ready to take you on. Hardcore criminal offenders. They go to great lengths to develop the deadly talents their career survival depends on. They have the training. They have the interest. And sooner or later, they get good in the ways they train. With the use of an extreme telephoto lens, you can see close up how they practice in small groups, usually with several lookouts. They use toothbrushes or pencils to simulate knives. But there's nothing pretend about their goal. Some of the weapons are crudely constructed from makeshift materials, razor blades taped to toothbrushes, or hidden in match packs, or melted into pens. A safety pin straightened out and sharpened, pieces of plexiglass or metal wrapped with cloth for a handle, or tied to a cutting edge that can be swung. But prisoners with access to metal shops can produce more sophisticated edged weapons, like these. Prison gangs customarily have their own edged weapon makers with special tricks of the trade. A sandpaper grip or a cloth handle strap will help control the weapon when it gets bloody. Rust sometimes is deliberately used to complicate injuries. Pointed weapons can easily be converted into spears with rolled up newspapers which have been soaked and dried to a hardened shaft. One correctional facility where a sergeant was killed reported 70 spear attacks on officers in a single year. Outside prison, there are those with martial arts training who prefer the edged instrument over other weapons because of its silence. It never jams, never has to be reloaded, and it doesn't leave a ballistic residue. Plus, they understand that even for violent crimes, our liberal courts tend to be more lenient with knife offenders than with criminals who use guns.
unfortunately, a suspect's type may not always be obvious to you as a warning sign. Especially when nothing seems out of the ordinary. And when low light level or fast action make it difficult to see his weapon. These problems, of course, are multiplied when an edged weapon offender has backup. To overcome these suspect advantages, it is crucial that you read danger cues in behavior and body language. Hey, it's black in the alley. What's the problem? Certain movements leave little doubt about intent. This represents imminent danger for sure. But many officers who become knife victims are so startled by a sudden charge that they freeze up. Sometimes you see an offender move to throw an edged weapon. The truth is, very few people can throw accurately, especially in the real world, where targets move. Also, a trained knife fighter will rarely throw away his weapon. Unless he has more that you can't see. A third type of behavior usually occurs as a defensive reaction by an offender. The taunting gesture. Get away from here. Get out of my house. Drop the razor. Stop it. Stop. And what he's telling you is, don't invade my space or I'll attack you. Show me your hands. Now. One of the most dangerous forms of concealment is palming. This hides the edged weapon while still positioning it for immediate use. If you can't see a suspect's palms or the straightened tips of all of his fingers and thumbs, that's a danger cue. Another clue to assessing threat potential is how the subject is holding the edged weapon once it becomes visible. A knife held point first with a loose grip may telegraph an attempt at an underhand or slinging throw. The saber hold is for throwing overhand and is generally even less effective. But it is more powerful and may cause injury even though the knife doesn't stick. The ice pick or Hollywood grip is how many officers envision being attacked. Either a novice or an expert can use it effectively. Ice pick grip is hard to defend against and can even be delivered like this. The underhand grip lets an attacker slash as well as stab. He can hold the weapon in the hand furthest from you to protect it from disabling strikes. Then his forward hand can block or grab your arm to clear the way to the target. Another popular position is the diagonal underhand grip, which shows even more skill because the knife's edge can be rotated to cut in backhand as well as forehand movements. Many targets are vulnerable to this technique. From the femoral artery in the groin to the arms, ribs, chest, the neck, and back. A very skilled knife fighter might use the reverse ice pick grip. Here the cutting edge is held to the outside for an effective forehand slash, which is followed by backhand stabs. The crucial tactic for your buying time to assess a suspect and to protect yourself against an edged weapon you don't immediately see is this. Control distance. Many officers, like the one on the left, really believe if they're close to the action, they're in control. But this attitude disregards the proxemics of the situation. That's the relationship between distance and the threat level produced by the weapon present. A common problem whether there's one officer involved or the whole shift. What about officers responding on the street below this offender? 
Are they too close to his gun threat? They're ignoring the concept of the reactionary gap, the distance you need from a potential threat to defend yourself if an attack is launched. For firearms assaults, a reactionary gap can be a half a mile or more if good cover isn't available. To defend yourself against assaults from hands and feet, you need a reactionary gap of about 10 feet. Most officers think that's good enough for edged weapons too. But this unrehearsed training exercise shows just how fast a knife offender can shrink your reactionary gap. Here, officers have been told to investigate suspicious circumstances at night in a warehouse and react to what they find. At first glance, this officer's distance from the suspect looks safe enough. But an attacker can easily cover this distance faster than most officers can draw their guns. Remember, when you close the distance between yourself and the suspect, do so only by purposeful decision. In fact, at close distances, your only realistic option for controlling a suspect is empty hand tactics. Yet when officers are asked how they would control a knife attacker, they usually say, I'd shoot him, forgetting that they may not have time to in reality. Here, still unrehearsed, is what really happens when officers assume they can automatically use deadly force against a knifer. They stand their ground and try to draw or try to draw and disengage simultaneously, or even worse, try to draw, fall down and shoot. And they lose, because time and distance work for the offender and against the officer. With a reactionary gap of about one foot or less, it's impossible for you to react quickly enough to even touch your holstered sidearm once the attack begins. At about five feet, the average officer can't even get his sidearm unholstered. Unless your sidearm or baton is already out, you'll have to rely on physical control at five feet or less. At about 10 feet, you might get your sidearm out, but you probably won't get a shot off. A suspect with a knife can close seven paces and deliver deadly force in less than one and one half seconds. For the average officer to deliver two rounds against an attacker who starts moving at 10 feet, the sidearm must already be drawn and ready to shoot. At about 15 feet, your chances get a little better if you're alert, anticipate danger, and are skilled with your equipment. But to deliver two rounds center of mass, your hand would already have to be on your sidearm when the attack begins. Tests with hundreds of officers reveal that in most cases, a minimum reactionary gap of 21 feet is required to react and deliver at least two rounds and to have enough time to move out of the attacker's path. And in certain other situations, you'll need more distance. Spring-loaded knives, like the ballistic knife, require a reactionary gap of about 40 feet Blowguns have been known to be accurate at 70 feet. What's the problem? There is no problem here. Well, you can go. Nobody calls. Let me see your hands. Hey, just, just go. There's nothing wrong here. Let me see your hands and step from the porch. With this, an offender can control at least 150 feet. Go find the dispatch. Incidentally, if you doubt that exotic edged weapons are ever used, here's a guy who underestimated the effective range of a hunting arrow. It penetrated four inches right through his heart. The rule remains, distance is your best defense unless adequate cover is available. Once you see the attacker, create a reactionary gap by enforcing voice commands or by using the unexpected, or consider full-scale disengagement. If he's charging and you're on foot, sidestepping unexpectedly will force him to slow down. When you can control the reactionary gap, you create time by creating distance. Time to compute your force options 
and time to communicate with the potential attacker. Here's my license. Why don't you come get it? Drop the knife. Fuck you. I said, drop the knife. Oh, OK, I'm just kidding. Sorry. Now back away. Turn away from me. When you can communicate, try to deliver your commands from behind cover and listen for cues to the suspect's psychology. Officer, he's the one that stole the meat. Hold it. Get away from the truck. What do you got under your coat? Some meat, man. Put the meat on the truck. Step away from the truck towards me. I'm going to need some identification. Here's your ID right here. 835, give me a backup, man, with a knife blackmail. Tate's food, 27 and National. Throw down the knife. Hey, man, I ain't throwing this knife down. This is special to me, man. Throw down the knife. Nah, nah, this knife cost me a bunch of money, man. 350 bucks. It's a Vietnam commemorative knife. All right, then just place the knife down slowly. It won't get scratched. Slowly place the knife down. All right, I'll do that. I'll mess up my knife. Though. Step away from the knife towards the auto. Now turn around with your arms extended up. Bend over and extend them back. Stay like that and don't move. Driver, exit your vehicle with your keys and step to the front of my squad car. Do it now. Sometimes you can use a barrier as a precaution when communicating, even though no edged weapon is visible. On a vehicle stop, where your assessment tells you not to approach, you can position the violator so your patrol car will hamper an attack. Do you have a driver's license? Can I see it, please? You can still see his vehicle and maintain good balance truck? while he stretches across with the license. No, I'm from out of town. I'm just here visiting. Your partner can monitor the passenger side. And don't touch me. I'm so sick of your shit. Anytime an edged weapon is visible, take advantage of your immediate surroundings. Walls, pillars, or other obstacles that can strengthen your reactionary gap. Lady, lady, drop the knife. I'm not dropping. Drop it right now. I said to drop it. If you have a problem, we'll talk about it. I want you to move over that way. All right, put that knife down. If you have a problem, we will talk about it. Put the knife down now. This man threatened to kill his wife, himself, and officers if they came near. Using the porch railing as a barrier, officers safely talked him into giving up. This man was peeved about the serving of a warrant, he started throwing shards of glass. The officer avoided injury by simply moving under the canopy while other officers covered at a distance. Squad 762 to 762W. Be advised I'm in position across from Paul Zuller on the northwest corner. 762W, 10-4. I'm set up in the southeast corner. When moving in for an arrest, be tactical in closing your reactionary gap. Remember that in half of all officer fatalities, the death weapon was concealed prior to assault. Police officer, don't move! A sharp offender is going to be watching and waiting for you to make a tactical error. Whatever your arrest technique, assume that any suspect could have weapons and try to use them at any time. I want you to turn around real slowly. Start turning. Set him up for handcuffing that's free of palmed weapons. Keep going. Keep turning. Stop. Now put your left hand on the top of your head with the palm up. Put your right hand back. Bring it back. Come down. Keep it coming. Now I want you to start walking backwards towards me real slowly. Thorough searching after handcuffing is crucial. Develop a consistent pattern that you follow each time to assure that all areas accessible to the suspect are checked. Stop. Every time. Don't move. While you're handcuffing, keep his hands lifted away from his waist and maintain control of them while you search. Back up nice and easy. Remove any hat and visually inspect his hair without touching it. Then start at the collar and move down. You want to touch lightly, then pinch and crimp clothing to best prevent being punctured or cut by sharp objects. I got a knife. If you do find something, acknowledge it to be sure your partner is aware that the danger level has just gone up.
Remember, edged weapons can be hidden in seams as well as pockets. Pull down any jacket to help restrain his arms. Then recheck his upper body to search his inner clothing. Undo his belt to make searching his waistband easier and check the belt and buckle for concealed weapons. Because some suspects may booby trap their clothing with fish hooks or razor blades, look before you touch. And consider running a mini baton or pen over hard to see areas first. When checking a limb, be sure you search all surfaces and push up clothing when possible to see what may be strapped to the body. You got another knife. Before transport, consider the option of removing and searching suspect shoes, especially boots and socks. Edged weapons are sometimes hidden even in secret compartments under the sole or in the heel. Wallets and purses can easily conceal edged weapons as well. If you find one weapon, keep searching. People who like edged weapons often like lots of them. This is a good point to remember when asking a subject for ID, as well as when you're searching. What's the most dangerous weapon? The one you don't see. I got a blade here. All these hidden weapons were taken off a suspect in the booking area after he was searched on the street. Come on, little piggy. Where we going, man? As you escort the suspect, maintain physical control to defeat any hostile move. In the car. <laughs> As his resistance mounts, slip your hand behind his arm and bend his wrist. Straighten up. Hey, man, you got me. Big, big hand. <laughs> Hook his shoulder near the neck with your other hand to pull him toward you off balance and exert enough pressure on his wrists to bring him up on his toes. This procedure will minimize his chances of disarming you and escaping. Sometimes the arrest process isn't so simple. Getting to the point where you can arrest and search the suspect becomes much more complicated, for example, if he goes mobile at some point. This EDP with a knife in his right hand is standing in front of his home. Officers are keeping their distance and trying to talk him down. As he becomes more agitated, three of the officers draw their sidearms, trying to contain him in a semicircle. Now he starts running down the sidewalk. The officer on the left waits with his baton. At the corner, the suspect still holds his knife in the ice pick grip and threatens to kill. Is the officer at a safe distance? He decides not to shoot, but would he have been justified in shooting? Or would you have waited and continued talking? Seven officers chase the suspect on foot. Here they circle the suspect again. He broke free and ran two more blocks, then crashed through the front window of a house. When he started attacking a resident inside, officers fired six shots, which finally stopped him. When you're threatened with an edged weapon, your appropriate force response ideally begins with your sidearm ready. Edged weapons are instruments of deadly force, 
and whenever possible, you must be prepared to use your ultimate force option if necessary. Whether you actually have to use deadly force will depend on the suspect's action. Think in terms of a three-part formula. Intent. Do the suspect's words and actions convince you that he means to kill or cause serious or lethal bodily harm to you or someone else? Does the threat here seem imminent? Yes, it does. Another element that must be present is a weapon. Some instrument with which he is capable of carrying out his deadly intent. That's present here, too. A third element is a delivery system. Does he have the means of getting the impact of that edged weapon from him to you to fulfill his intent? Here, the suspect is certainly activating his delivery system. When intent, weapon, and delivery system are present, and the threat is imminent, you are justified in using deadly force. Hi, you called? Yes, sir. I'm the manager. There's a woman getting raped in apartment 24 right now. This is a passkey. I don't want to get involved in it. There's a couple of doors on the right-hand side. Room 24? Yes, sir. Okay, we'll check it out. We'll let you know what happens. Thanks, sir. Police! Hello, police! Of course, you'll want to preclude or eliminate the possibility of using some lower level of force. You want to be certain of your target identification and try to achieve target isolation so no third parties are needlessly endangered. your firearm, remember this acronym, SMENS. You shoot to stop the attacker's threatening action. You move out of the attacker's path. You evaluate whether the attacker has been incapacitated. You neutralize the continuing threat if it has not been stopped. And finally, you scan the area for other threats. How many edged weapons do you see now?
Put your hands up where I can see them now! You okay? I've been hit! Squad 44. Go ahead, Squad 44. 44, assist. Officer down, shots fired. 625 South 6. 10 4, Squad 44. All units, assist officers, shots fired. 625 South 6th Street. Squad 42. As part of your response, you also want to think CCRR. Take cover as soon as tactically feasible. Communicate with suspects. Communicate with other officers. Communicate with dispatch. Reload your weapon, ideally from behind cover. And recover or protect the weapon. It's important as evidence, and you don't want it to disappear or be accessible to hostile hands. Anytime blood's around, use rubber gloves to guard against infection. And touch the weapon where there's the least risk of destroying fingerprints. Today, most crime labs prefer that recovered edged weapons be transported in a box rather than a plastic bag for better preservation. I got a knife. If blood or fingerprints are not considerations, a knife in a sheath can be secured in your gun belt. A bare blade can be stuck between cartridge holders and your Sam Brown, leaving your hands free. 421 dispatch. 421. 421 ETA to the mental health center is approximately one minute. 10 4 421. 421 dispatch, we're 1023, mental health center. Although your gun is usually your best defense against an edged weapon, some circumstances may require other options. A baton is an alternative many officers have used successfully. But understand its limitations with edged weapons. Okay. Put the glass down, Ted. Ted, can you hear me? Ted, put the glass down, Ted. Just put it down. All we want to do is talk to you. Just a baton down. works best when the attacker is not experienced with edged weapons, when the action is moving slowly, when you're not imminently threatened, and when you have enough backup, including at least one cover officer, with gun ready. Ted, put the glass down. Get out of here. Ted, put the glass down, Ted. Take another step and you're dead. If I, if I don't kill you, I'm gonna kill myself. is not a distractor. Use it to neutralize his delivery system. Please. Put the knife on. Hit as hard as you can to cause a dysfunction of the extremity and force a release of the weapon quickly follow through with repeat strikes or physical control, or get back and get your gun out. Contrast that with a more typical use of the baton in knife encounters. This EDP repeatedly told officers, one of you is going to get killed. When this officer failed to deliver effective baton strikes, he was stabbed just after this picture was taken. How skilled are you with the baton? It won't help you if you've left it behind in your patrol car as the officer driving this unit discovered. Once he got inside and met a 17-year-old with a knife. 
Sometimes empty hand control is your only option for stopping an attack. The off-duty officer on the right was being chased by an EDP armed with two knives. But when the officer fired and missed and then ran out of ammunition, he couldn't perform any effective physical control techniques and ended up getting killed. When you can't create or maintain distance or you have no other choice, you may have to know effective unarmed defense as a last resort. But be aware of extensive misinformation on this subject. Hey, man, what are you doing here? Standing around. Well, why are you standing here and not on some street corner somewhere? Free country, man. I can stand where I want. Well, I don't like that. Let me see what's in your hand over here. You got some ID or something, man? Yeah, I got something for well, you. Well, let me see. Ah! Sometimes trainers claim fist fighting works, but usually it doesn't, because it doesn't stabilize the weapon. Remember classic techniques like the X block? This just wastes time and gives him an easy target by keeping you in line with the motion of his weapon. Never use anything valuable as an obstacle. Tactics designed to defeat traditional physical control measures are widely available and taught to civilians. A basic concept for countering obstacles is simply to redirect the edged weapon and keep attacking from another angle. Here, an amateur photographer captured this officer standing far too close to a suspect with a buck knife. The officer grabs the suspect's wrist, trying to disarm him. But the suspect simply switches the knife to his other hand. A struggle develops, increasing the risk to the officer who's afraid to shoot because of bystanders. Only later does the officer manage to get the suspect to the ground. Luckily, the fall breaks the offender's wrist and no one gets stabbed. Most unarmed defenses require that you be standing up to be successful. In reality, you may be running, already down on the ground or getting out of your patrol car. Unless your moves allow you to immediately control or defeat the blade from any position, you'll continue to be vulnerable to tactics like multiple strikes. A more effective technique when you're moving and behind the suspect is a rapid takedown without letting him stop and turn. Here, the officer grabs the suspect's wrist and elbow in an escort grip. Then the suspect is stunned against the ground with a forceful arm bar. Throw the knife away! Throw it out! Put your arms out to your side! Even though the Watch officer side, was not initially out. aware of the knife threat, good physical tactics kept him safe. Let me see your hand. Knife! Drop the knife! One tactical option for close-up self-defense is to forcefully sweep and shove the attacker's knife arm away to deflect his attack. Then quickly move forward to expand your reactionary gap. This is called sweep and disengage. Sir, I'm stopping you for a speeding violation. I need to see your driver's license. Do you have one with you? Drop! Oh, no! Sir, don't move. Put your hands. Don't move. Put your hands out to the side. Put them out to the side. Put your palms up. Don't move. Stay right there. If sweep and disengage is not possible, you want to employ the principle of gun. You grab his knife hand with both your hands, high up to immobilize his hand so he can't rotate his weapon. Grabbing properly is critical. Using two hands doesn't mean like this. And grabbing the arm instead of high up on the wrist and hand leaves the offender too much freedom of movement. This mother threatening her baby was more effectively defeated. An officer waited until she was distracted, then grabbed her so he could successfully control the knife. Next, you undo the weapon from his grasp, which may require multiple knee strikes or some other technique to weaken his control. Knee strikes are repeated, all-out power drives to his abdomen, not his groin, accompanied by verbal commands. Finally, you neutralize his desire to resume the attack by creating distance and getting prepared in case deadly force becomes necessary. 
Remember, empty hand control should be a last resort. Often you can avoid this completely by improving your approach tactics. Like ordering this offender away from his bike before you walk up. In some cases, two officers can apply the gun principle. One secures the offender's wrist and hand. The other delivers multiple blows to his forearm to create dysfunction. If you press your thumb into the mound on top of your forearm, you'll find a nerve center that causes weakness in your hand. That's ideally the spot you want to hit on the suspect. <laughs> Look at a live one. Hello, ladies. Hi there. Hello. Hello. I got some spare change. Did you get some spare time? Is that it? Spare change. Oh, what do you think this it. is, huh? Well, we don't take any spare uh -oh. change. What's what do you name? Well, let's see what you hey, got. Pal. In they call Rod. Me. Hey, buddy. Rod. 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 Why don't you hit the road? Move down the street. Hit the road. Move down the street. Down the street. Move it. Move it. Right. I told you, girls, I didn't want you working my street. And I told you to get the fuck out of here. A variation of the gun principle is possible when you can stun the assailant's hand against a solid surface. Oh. Left hand behind your head. Oh, okay, you hurt me, you asshole. You're under arrest. Oh, so are you. Left hand behind your back. Okay. At any time during an edged weapon assault, accept the fact that you may get cut. You will bleed and feel pain. But if you're prepared for this injury, you can surprise your enemy by not losing your cool when he expects you to do so. Targets that you must try hardest to protect include your chest and upper abdominal area, where a wound can cause catastrophic bleeding. Another protection priority is the neck area, where the carotid artery and jugular vein are located just under the skin. Also, protect your groin region, where a severed femoral artery or other nearby artery can spurt out a fatal quantity of blood in just a few moments. If an offender gets your face, bleeding or eye cuts can impair your fighting ability. Your back offers an attacker the base of your brain and your kidneys lower down. Will soft body armor protect you against edged weapons? In some cases, yes. The deputy who was attacked wearing this vest was stabbed. But the vest limited the weapon's depth of penetration and allowed him to keep going. On the other hand, there are no guarantees with any piece of police equipment. Would a vest or anything else have saved this victim? Some body armor models have been designed for added protection by including a special trauma plate or other stab-resistant material designed to inhibit lethal penetration. But most conventional vest models aren't foolproof against many stabbing blades. Soft body armor is designed to stop the blunt trauma of bullets, not sharp points. However, as this officer happily discovered, many vests will significantly increase your protection against slashes. His assailants slashed through several layers of Kevlar, but the officer did not get cut. Remember that knife wounds don't produce the extreme hydrostatic shock of bullet wounds. Unless the edged weapon has pierced a vital organ, it's quite possible to remain functional. A lot of blood doesn't necessarily mean a lot of serious injury. Once the suspect has fled or is neutralized, visually inspect yourself. You may have wounds you don't feel. Control bleeding by using direct, constant pressure over the wound. Use your palm or other available object. This will help stop the flow of blood to permit clotting. Consciously, make your breathing slow, deep, and rhythmic. This will lessen your adrenaline rush, slow down your rate of bleeding, and delay the onset of shock. 6 3 dispatcher. When a leg or arm is injured, Raise the limb so gravity helps reduce blood pressure at the wound site. Maintain control over the suspect and keep direct pressure on your injury until help arrives. Unit 653 to dispatcher. With a chest wound, protect your airway. Tilt your head back slightly and keep your chin up to hyperextend your neck. This will keep your airway open if you lose consciousness. 
If a lung has been punctured, there's risk of it collapsing unless the wound is sealed. Tightly press your hand or a piece of airtight material directly over the wound. In this case, the officer removed plastic from inside his hat. A credit card can also work. You want to exhale, then cover the wound next to the skin if possible. Try to breathe normally and get help. In this situation, the weapon itself may provide sufficient direct pressure to restrict the flow of blood. Don't remove it. Hold it in place. Do you guys have any idea as to where the officers are at? I don't know. This is the location they gave us. Well, why don't you check with your dispatcher and make sure this is the correct address? And then why don't you check continuing this way for me? I'll call the street and check behind you. Sounds good. Okay. When you do call for assistance, be specific about your exact location and injuries. Lying on a stomach wound lets the weight of your body apply pressure while your hands stay free to control the suspect and update communications. 20 hour. I'm up on the upper deck, East National, by the tracks. 10 4 20 hour. Ambulance has been sent. All units responding to 20 hour's location will be advised he is on the upper level near the commuter tracks. Go for it. I'm going to blow your brains off. As you continue your deep breathing, commit yourself right now. I will survive. What made me survive was that I didn't give up. When you give up, you die. It's, it's just that simple. You have to just pull that strength from within you, either, either through fear, through the desire to go home to your family, or through hatred. Three things kept me going during that thing. The first thing was the conscious effort to keep after this guy. The second thing was, is I just don't like to lose. And the third thing was, is that the people that lived in that house were friends of mine. If I didn't have enough of a responsibility as a policeman, I had an even bigger responsibility as a friend. So I just kept on, and it worked out. When they finally took me to the hospital, I was, uh, I was in bad shape. I had a blood pressure of 60 over nothing. I was literally dying right there. Uh, on the lawn. I was scared to death. Uh, I remember one of the things I said to my partner when she caught me when I fell, I said, please don't let me die. You know, don't let me die here. Uh, they got me to the hospital and they performed emergency surgery on my chest to try to reinflate my lung and to try to draw some of the blood out of there. And one of the things I remember out of the whole thing was uh, seeing a priest come in and give me last rites. I'll never forget that. I remember him looking at me and I remember looking up at him and seeing that white collar, and I just said, God, I don't, I don't believe it. I just don't believe it. And I remember him just making a cross on my forehead and giving me last rites. In my mind, I'm never going to die in no ghetto. Absolutely never. If a man turns around and punches me in the head, the fight's on. If he cuts me, the fight's on. If I'm shot, the fight is on. I'm not losing no fight to no scumbag out there in no ghetto, period. That's it. No son of a bitch out there is going to get me. The only way he gets me is cut my head off, and I mean that. I'll fight you till I got a breath left in me. I don't think any of those animals in that street can beat me. And I've gone that way for 18 years of street service, street duty, and that's the way I'm gonna keep on going. You don't lose the fight. After my partner died, I had a lot of calls where I came across uh, edged weapons that people had in their possession, concealed, uh, even as work tools. You just look upon the, these knives as differently, or I do, than prior to the incident happening. It gets worse, you know. It doesn't get any better. It just every time you, uh, you think about it, it gets worse.
I just wish it never happened. Just, just don't take a knife uh, for granted. <clears throat> it's a big mistake. It's, it's a really, really big mistake. It might be the worst mistake of your life. It might be the last one you're ever able to make. <laughs>